A word to the wise. We are an explicit podcast tackling content with adult themes, as well as entering spoiler territory if you aren't caught up with us yet. That is through chapter 43 of Brandon Sanderson's The Hero of Ages. Hey there, this is Cross. And I'm PJ. And we are Words and Whiskey, a podcast for veteran and novice readers alike. We tackle fiction novels and love to talk about what we're drinking. You should think of us as your intoxicating weekly book club. You know, Crossland, every mm-hmm. once in a while we start an episode in a goofy mood. Goofy and goobers. I feel like it makes for some of the best episodes. And that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> I'm setting us up for failure by saying that out loud. I know. Goofy mood. But I feel so good right now. This I'm is so weird, excited to get into this. This is a weird week to be in a goofy mood, to your point, because it's not, you know, it's kind of two weeks of rolling the ball it's right true. now. You know what I mean? Like, we've been really just, like, putting pieces into place for the most part outside of where this chapter or where this part starts. You know what I mean? And some of that is partially my fault because the next chapter is the end of a part. So you can assume that that ends fairly dramatically. However, I like the idea of breaking it up the way I did. I know. So. I trust you. But also, no, I, I trust you. I trust it's going to be great. Implicitly. It's kind of the name of the game. You have to trust me when it comes to breaking this up. So, whoops. <laughs> All right. So with that, today is our sixth episode discussing The Hero of Ages by Brandon Sanderson, and we are going to chat about chapters 37 through 43. But before we do that, PJ, what are you having today? I made myself an Aperol Spritz. Nice. Didn't measure it. I just put some ice cubes and a slice of orange in the glass, poured the rest of the champagne that I had, a couple splashes of Aperol, and then I actually, just for volume's sake, Topped it off with some orange juice, which maybe makes it less of an Aperol spritz and more of something entirely different. But it's really good. <laughs> Sweeter than you would expect an Aperol spritz to be. Hmm. Just naturally, understandably, with, with orange juice. But you still get that that bitter note that comes through. And it's, it's orange flavored, so it makes sense. So it's great. Easy drinking. Yeah, that sounds tasty. Um, yeah. Did you add any club soda or sparkling or just like subbing in the orange juice instead i I like to do it with just champagne got it got it got it got it i know i know it often calls for club soda or sparkling water but i feel like all that does is water it down and i believe that's what technically makes it a spritz (laughs) oh the champagne spritzy (laughs) i believe the point of a spritz is it for for it to be a low alcohol content cocktail and part of that is literally <laughs> and you're like, nah, I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> nah, that's a ploy. That's a- <laughs> fucking big alcohol. <laughs> kidding. You. Big cocktail. You're right. You know, you make a good point. Champagne is spritzy enough. This is more fun. I will take no more further questions on that. Back half beer is Scorpius Morcello, which is a double IPA from Toppling Goliath. So, Nice, heavy, hazy IPA out of beautiful Decorah, Iowa. Nice. What are you drinking, Crossland? I am having a martini, PJ, a dry martini, to kind of end June, as it were. And it feels kind of ceremonial going into what we're calling our dry July for the for the, show and for the podcast. So... For the rest of July, with maybe the exception of a special episode coming out near the end of the month as a short pour, we're not going to be we're going to be doing mocktails and other things like that. So I figured I'd have a dry martini. I mean, pretty straightforward. I'm doing it kind of as a combination of gin and vodka. So two ounces of gin, one ounce vodka, half ounce dry vermouth. And then as opposed to orange bitters, like I said the other day, did a grapefruit bitters to kind of substitute in there as opposed to the usual orange bitters. Yeah. 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 yeah, so it's kind of a spin. It's like somewhere between a martini and a dry martini. Like it's very kind of it's a martinis are interesting martini. cause it's a, Yeah, well, it's it's like a free flow thing. I don't know. So it's a damp martini. 
we'll call it the damp martini. <laughs> it's disgusting <laughs> and it fits me perfectly. It's yellow. I used I used like just a splash of Lule Blanc to give it a little bit of character so that it actually looked like something. Because <laughs> it's like so there's something to like just drinking something that's clear that makes my body think that it's water, and then I get really disappointed when it's not. <laughs> so I had to color it a little bit with you know a tinge of Lille Blanc to give it a little bit of something because it was just too white and pale. That makes more sense than what I was thinking. I was thinking you had used the barrel aged gin. I'm like, how did he get that much color based on just that little amount of gin? Little amount of gin. There's two one ounce ounces versus, of gin in here. Oh, baby. I thought it was two ounce vodka, two to one. one ounce gin. Nope. Other way around. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Gin forward. You could do vodka forward, but I was almost out of Reikia as well, so I didn't. That's the other reason that I went gin forward. Makes sense. No back half beer. This is just a, like a one and a half, basically, instead. That's like where I'm saying two, a two and a one, and a one, three, somewhere between three quarter and one, considering you add the Lille Blanc or whatever. So it's like a one and a half martini, but All yeah, right. I've got some tea to follow that up. It's the game plan. Perfect. So, yep. Cool. All right. So before we talk about the chapters, PJ, I want to know, how'd you feel about this week's reading? It again kind of feels like more dominoes like last week, kind of a progression of that. We do get some cool payoff, like specifically with Spook, but in Marsh, I think and Marsh. That's a good point. But even even so, it's a little bit, but it's still more questions and more like wondering how this will ultimately get resolved. Like It's a Mm -hmm. false climax at not climax, but you know what I mean. Like it's a, it's a, it's a peak, but like there's still more up to go. Yeah, I, I would tag in a little bit there and say that like all of, not all of our characters are running at the same pace towards their rising action. Like not mm-hmm. all the plots are accelerating at the same rate. Um, right. It feels like so. That's true. Mm-hmm. That leaves it kind of with that uneven feeling to some degree because we do have people like like you said, like Spook has these climactic moments. Even Vin starts there and then de-escalates and kind of sits in that de-escalation. Mm-hmm. All right. Sweet. So with that kind of general thought process, let's go into the chapters. And as we were kind of saying, we start here with chapter 37 talking about Vin kind of snapping right into action right away with the way that the last week ended with those bells being run very climactically. We almost immediately jump into her flying through the air into battle against Yeoman's troops. He's proven to be smart, you know, less metal, almost no one has metal. The horses aren't even equipped with metal horseshoes using stone Mm -hmm. weapons instead, stone tipped spears and arrows and the like, which Vin views as a fun challenge. And she meets that challenge with a tent and boy oh boy is that a cool cool little moment where she sends that thing flapping around in the air and spinning in all directions and it's great i I don't know what it is about this section but it just feels alive it feels electric Mm -hmm. and in a way that's somehow different than the other like fight scenes that we've gotten from branderson throughout this series and i've loved those Obviously, I've drooled over them in the past, but this just feels differently alive, but in a also good way. I loved it. Loved the way that all of this was described, especially that tent that you were talking about, how every little bit of it is important. The the fabric itself cutting people off at the legs and tripping them up and the metal spikes that were used to hold it down going off in every direction. And I mean, it's sad that the horses don't have horseshoes. Both from the horse's perspective and from Vin's perspective, maybe it's good for the horses that they don't have horseshoes. Ultimately, probably really good for them. Yeah, but it probably hurts, right? (laughs) It probably does hurt. I mean, fair fair point. But at the same time, can you imagine what Vin would do to a horse at this point if it had the horseshoes on the bottom of its feet? Yeah, that horse doesn't have feet anymore. (laughs) No, no, knees are going the wrong direction. Yeah. Oh no. So it's good for the horses. Oh man. Yeah. Oof. Anyway, she's showing some improvisation, Mm -hmm. quite a bit of improvisation with this tent scene, and it's sowing some chaos into the battle, but it's well described and just kind of fun. Yeah, I I think that's a great way to describe it. Like we've been saying, like it's it is it's a twist. One of the things that I really like about the series is the way that 
Brandon uses the characters to show different ways to use the magic systems, like to use even Allomancy in different situations and how like Vin's grown and changed and thinks of these tricks and different moves and different moments wherein, you know, Kelsier in the first book predominantly was just sort of a kind of a almost an eloquent brute of sorts was very, you know, brutish and brutal and described as, you know, intense using like people to bounce and kind of move around in a very different way. It's always neat whenever Vin enters a combat scene because it is always so fundamentally different and she tries different things and really uses her environment to its best. And that Mm -hmm. I think is really important because we aren't fighting in a city here for once we're fighting in the middle of a field. So what does she have to use? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it does kind of make you realize that a, she's still a formidable force when there's something to be used, even if it's not uh, conventional, but if there's nothing to be used, like if this was void of metal, she would still have her pewter to be, to be fair. And she'd still have like her rioting and soothing, but I don't think she'd be able to really contend with mounted cavalry. (laughs) No. Yeah. She'd be in a very different, I mean, she's proven before to be able to do, you know, things in these kind of situations, like in Mm -hmm. in the last book, some of that was drived off the fact that they weren't prepared for her and they were wearing metal. Unlike what we see here. So they were also not prepared. I think she would still be a challenge to kind of what you were saying, but I, I don't think that, you know, there's something to be said about her ingenuity, allowing her to kind of take an extra step Mm -hmm. and make her something else. That's even a little bit more formidable. Yeah. Like they, they're assuming that they're putting her into that position where she has nothing. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're engaging is because they think they, they can take her. Like, presumably you wouldn't go into a losing battle off the jump. Some would. Depends yeah, depends on the hubris there, of the of the of the commander. But <laughs> there is an argument that they might be going into this losing battle intentionally because they know that they're going to cause the problem with the coloss, or that that risk potential is worth. That's it. a good point. But that's not entirely. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. After dispatching the soldiers in the army, she burns the bronze and detects the shadow in the mist, thumping with power of the metals and leaps after it. She chases it from camp into Fadric's proper as the alamancer she was chasing hid itself again from her sight. What what does this make you kind of think? Well, there there's a, an added complexity here that you didn't mention, but I think is very important. She sees this figure as a tangible non-spirit being smaller than ellen i don't know i'm i'm still thinking it it's it's still a spirit like that's my only thought is that it's not actually a mistborn like i'm gonna kind of hold on to that myself for now but it it got me to start thinking about gold some more weirdly because i think it's conceivable that this mistborn that she's seeing is herself Hmm. I just don't know why that makes sense yet. And gold hasn't been explored in any real way other than that alloy electrum. Was that it? Yeah. Poor man's ATM. Yep. So there, there was electrum, but we haven't gotten a whole lot out of gold proper yet. And I think this would be a cool way to introduce it because it's just, descri- she's describing this tangible figure she calls it he, I think, the entire time. Yeah. But yeah. I think it's entirely possible that this is also Vin or some form of Vin. Sure. And that's that's based on her kind of personifying it, I think, based on size, I think, is kind of her factor that she's kind of giving it that. But yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I mean... That's certainly uh, I don't I don't have any I don't have any expectation that you're going to come back with anything on that one. Only a theory. Uh, I'm going to push up my glasses here and move on to the next question. That said, I I do really enjoy the scene where it is like kind of chasing after this this mistborn and the, the thumping and everything else. And I think she does say something about there being a physicality to it, which is that part of where you're grabbing gold from. Yeah, she she says that it's not like she sees it as. A person, not as a spirit. I think Mm -hmm. almost explicitly says that it's not a spirit. Yeah. What she sees. Yeah. 
that that sounds right. Pretty sure that's right. Okay. <laughs> so while Vin and Ellen were distracted with the going on of the camp, something else occurred. Their colossal forces were halved by a surprise trebuchet ambush, as well as Ellen losing control of them during their powerful frustration in which they caused a majority of the damage to themselves, kind of warring in their blood rage. As Ellen himself says, this lead leaves a dangerous precedent in its wake. The fact that control can be severed in the first place is a horrifying idea that makes this formerly kind of tenuous army, this army that seemed kind of like a sure thing, a little, a lot more tenuous. Yeah. So it, horrifying, dangerous precedents. Sure. But I think also looking at it from their perspective, understanding that the Coloss and the inquisitors are, controlled by the same means this means that ruins grasp on the inquisitors isn't necessarily ironclad and could be distracted away from him potentially yeah so i, I think, think that kind of gets to something that marsh has been positing this whole time right right exactly yeah. so but but i think that's something that vin and ellen maybe will come to realize at some point but are too kind of caught up in the immediacy of their issues to take any like silver lining out of it. And maybe they don't quite understand. No, I think they're starting to understand that hemallergy is tied to both Coloss and inquisitors. So Bruin's control over the inquisitors is the same, like the same me- mechanism. So hopefully they can start seeing that silver lining as opposed to seeing it as this horrible prospect and dangerous mm-hmm. precedent. Yeah, I I think they start to connect those dots in chapter 40. Specifically, I think it's originally brought to light here with how this chapter ends, right? Which is this encounter that happens between human and Vin, wherein kind of talk to push too far an accident made to work through the camp after she's pushing on reproduction and thinks that if she does something similar to what she does to Ten Soon, she might kind of push and and break something to make it happen and Mm. um instead of it being communication it's almost like a physical god like a physical need to then go and reproduce and spike take a couple of these spikes out and spike together a coloss so this is this is horny coloss There are moments every once in a while in the show where I'm like, how does one even respond to that within reason? I mean, sure. I think that, you know, the entirety of the carnal desire to reproduce. uh, I mean, I guess it manifests itself a lot more like Dr. Frankenstein than like anything we're used to. Yes. Yes. Much more like Dr. Frankenstein. Speaking about human and that interaction around the reproduction. Anything you want to say about this incredibly deep scene? Jesus Christ. You just want to leave it on this Frankenstein no, joke? No, I can't. It, it, I mean, how how am I going to change like gears at this point? But to try to, like it's heart-wrenching to understand that like this I am human comment is coming from not a place of desire to be human, but of a desire to be like to to go back to the humanity that he knows he came from and it's it's so much more touching and sad it is i i mean and that's that's sort of i think one of the crazy things about this coloss naming himself human right yeah is that there is this sort of bitter irony when he says i am human because it is both in name and in actuality he is a human and I think just based on the way that the communication has worked so far, it doesn't seem like much like the Chandra not not being able to talk about the contract. Uh, maybe not so much. There, there's a compelling, like an external compelling compulsion, an external compulsion, compulsion. to not share the information of how this works. <clears throat> so mm-hmm. that naming himself of, as human I think was his subconscious way of trying to fight that compulsion and trying to like express what he was actually trying to say, but being entirely unable to. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's some further supposition of, of this that we can definitely talk about in one of the log books this week, 
So we'll definitely kind of talk about it more because I think it gets a little bit closer to kind of what we're trying to poke at here, which is this idea of the the sort of what's the degree of humanity that they actually retain. Right. Yeah. And is this, like you're saying, kind of a subconscious pull, you know, where does this fully fully come from? And to what degree does it come from? Especially yeah. considering we know that there are multiple humans in human. So it's it's five humans that were killed for the spikes. Or four humans that were killed for the spikes. And then one that was reanimated, essentially, with the, the other four spikes, right? That's that's what I understood by it. Because each spike was given gives the blessing of potency or whatever. I think it's equated to the blessing or similar to the blessing of potency. Okay. So I don't think it's explicitly dated at this point, but what it does say is that it's not the melding of two people, but of five as evidenced by the four spikes need to make them not five bodies, of course, but five souls. So yeah. Yeah. So it's not like it's being a bunch of bodies stitched together, but I think that there is, it hasn't been explicitly stated, but we are, Right. It feels like we are on the verge of that revelation of like how far does this because go? They they also I think before Vin stops him, they they say it seems like he was going to take the two unconscious bodies and use both of them. Mm-hmm. But that's not really further explained either. Yeah. Yeah. I believe you're right that it is just the four spikes. And then a fifth person, but I don't know if we were fully. We're not. We don't get any clarity, like yeah. any confirmation or clarity yet, as far as I understand, unless I just missed it. But no, no, I don't think you did, which is what I was just searching for. So cool. All right. With that, we go into chapter 38. And I like to call this logbook Holy Hemology Batman because <laughs> it is a lot of, of hemology. Hell, most of the logbooks that we're going to be talking about this week are hemological in in relation um Mm -hmm. so to start this one off it's a long boy here hemallergy fun fact (laughs) the creepy creatures that are in lysi's story which is a a stephen king book are referred to as long boys (laughs) yep every time anyway did you watch that (laughs) yeah i figured it's on apple tv i didn't know that you did Mm -hmm. Hmm. what'd you think i liked it okay i enjoyed it yeah do you know that stephen king wrote the whole thing yeah all the scripts, like the, I don't mean just the book. I mean, he wrote Oh, all the I didn't scripts. know that. No. Yeah. That's pretty cool. What did you think of it? I enjoyed it. I think it was in some ways an improvement on the book. It, it improved some things. And I think in other ways I missed one detail, but he decided to make all of the changes that he did. And so, you know, can't fault him for it. It is his personal favorite book of his own that he's written. So. All right. Good to know. And as such. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good book. I, I really enjoy it. Anyway, <laughs> moving on from that little long tangent. Boy. Long boys. So, hemallergy can be used to steal alimentic or ferrochemical powers and give them to another person. However, a hemallergic spike can also be created by killing a normal person, one who is neither an alimenter nor a ferrochemist. In that case, the spike instead steals the very power of preservation existing within the soul of people. That power that... in the power that, in fact, gives all people sentience. A hemallergic spike can extract this power, then transfer it to another, granting them residual abilities similar to those of alamancy. After all, preservation's body, a tiny trace of which is carried by every human being, is the very same essence that fuels alamancy. And so, a conjure granted the blessing of potency is actually acquiring a bit of innate strength similar to that of burning pewter. The blessing of presence grants mental cap- capacity in a similar way, while the blessing of awareness is the ability to sense with greater acuity and the rarely used blessing of stability grants emotional fortitude so we kind of mm-hmm. get our conjure rules here we do we get our conjure rules we also get a higher level clarity on the way people work in this world yeah <laughs> the way souls work basically but it also brings up the question of does that mean if every single person has a little bit of preservation, which is the source of allomancy, could every single person hypothetically snap? And could every single person hypothetically become a mistborn as opposed to just a misting? Like, what makes that distinction 
if all of them are seeded with the same base, like core power? That is a very interesting question because it does raise the question of like, does like you're saying, does everyone have a base alimantic capability? And as such, is everyone secretly an alimancer? But but the question that I pose here back a little bit is the sort of alimancy didn't show up until the right. ascension, right? It was but, those nine people that were given the ability to tap into it, I guess. Mm-hmm. Then. Okay. Right. But there but I, I'm not I'm not using that to dissuade you. What I'm what I'm trying to do is just clarify a little bit. That means though that potentially, given the fact that we know that it's not as though preservation and ruin suddenly appeared in a thousand in that during that moment that you know ascension, because like we know that preservation is given what we have right here, it says the preservation is what gives people sentience, meaning that much older than just that thousand year ago time. Mm-hmm. Um, could everyone could all of the ancient people have been alamancers and then it just slowly has been kind of bred out over time that'd be interesting like just a dilution of the gene pool to a certain extent or the the capability yeah hmm. and then those little tiny nuggies yeah. of elementic power reintroduce the sort of pure body back into the bloodstream or back into the gene pool hmm. this is totally a theory i'm throwing you, no i know i yeah. know that's but where would it have gone if it's all seeded within everybody anyway? What's what's getting bred out? I don't know. I guess I'm saying that it's diluted, but yeah, you raise a fair yeah. point. That means that there has to be something that would be destroying it mm-hmm. or fighting against it, mm. perhaps ruining it. Ayo, <laughs> call out. <laughs> that said, like the the residual abilities are interesting. Like a hemorrhagic spike being able to steal this part of a body of a god, basically from a person. And even give these small blessings, which are the conjure blessings, versus the serious capabilities that hemology has to steal from someone that is like a focus of these sort of higher level of levels of magic is very unique and interesting, I think. It mm-hmm. shows that hemology has power pretty much no matter what. Simultaneously, yeah. the most powerful and weakest of the three. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I am coming to realizations like what in the moment and they're not relevant right now. So I'm sorry that I'm like kind of distracted, but specifically talking about these, these blessings. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, especially when talking about what Tensoon talks about later, how each one requires two spikes. My assumption is each of those spikes are one of the pairs like one of each pair of alimantic metals working together because like stability, like they're, they're, they, it, it all follows yep. kind of those I'm tracking yeah. an internal yep. external. Yep. What are the additional blessings then that we're missing? What could those be? And have those shown up ever, anywhere? Hmm. And could Ten soon give himself more blessings working together with Marsh and Vin maybe to create different spikes I don't know. Huh. I just, I have ideas. I have thoughts. I just don't know where to go with them. But like Atium and Duralamin as a blessing would be pretty fucking dope, I think. Be pretty good for Tensoon. Mm-hmm. You know, the ability to see into the future would be pretty helpful for a dog. Yeah. A strong, a strong dog. Mm-hmm. A strong, a strong. Strong. Strog. Strog tour. Sorry. Like, <laughs> like I said, it was a tangent, no, yeah. but I'm just like, I started thinking about it more. So, I mean, it's good. I, I think that one of the fun things about hemology is that it is a little bit more open as far as rules go. It has seemingly more freedoms, if that makes sense, because it's yeah. number one capability is stealing. <laughs> so like it's namely, it namely its capability is stealing something. Yeah. So, but then there are also weird, uh, seemingly out of left field constraints, like the placements of those hemological spikes on a human body. There's like 300 some odd tie points or whatever he calls them Mm -hmm. locations where you have to pound them through. Or is it always the heart? It's not always the heart. Yeah. I don't know. There are missing rules 
but at the same time you're right it does feel more open so yes yes i'm not saying that we are by any means complete like you said there are specifics that are missing but it does have a little bit more of a i think a wider application because it is a little bit more widely applicable um, Mm -hmm. than these sort of internal storing and then internal burning metals this is there are more factors to consider yeah yeah so Back in chapter 38, of course, which is where we are, back with Spook overlooking as people pick their way across the blackened ruin of another burned building. He's questioning what he's been gifted at the Alimantic pair of Tin and Pewter and whether or not Kelsier might extend him more abilities. There's a lot going on in Spook's head at this moment, kind of including wandering thoughts about the citizen's sister, kind of even some general thoughts about Kelsier, what should be done for the city, Quellian. What do you what do you make of Spook in this moment? So talking about tin and pewter specifically, I had genuinely forgotten that those two were paired together. Hmm. And I feel like you and I had a very similar conversation as what spook has in his head in the first book when we're talking about the metals. So that was, it was a fun memory lane kind of passage for me, like thing like, Oh yeah, I remember like questioning all these metals and what do they mean? And why are they paired together and fucking naive craziness that I could kind of long for a little bit right now? <laughs> take away some of these, un- take away some knowledge. <laughs> no, it's, it's just crazy how quickly all of this information has stacked on top of itself and exploded. Yeah, it's, it's like you've kind of got like a little mini rule book, like a little mini chat book in your head for like how all these different things work and interact. And that's why I mm-hmm. think it's really nice to be in Spook's perspective and to step back and only think about two of these abilities right now, which I think is really great because that gives us this yeah. perspective on, you know, just a couple of limiting factors here. And I think that makes Spook's Spook as a character compared to Vin and Ellen a little bit more interesting because he has more limitations. It's so funny because one of the things that Brandon often talks about is instead of like designing magic system is, is that the limit is typically what makes the system interesting, not the like limits of power, but instead the limitations of your ability to use the power. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what, uh, why I think spook kind of being stuck with just these two abilities right now is a little bit more interesting than uh, Vin and Ellen. Cause we've kind of seen the extent of a lot of these things. Totally. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So makes for fun, some fun stuff. I also love the little conversation that spook and Farson have here about his sister relating to the skulls in the building and that there was a way out. Obviously it's very grim, but I mean kind of the mystery behind this. This is obviously an intro to the hidden tunnels as well as the hypocrisy of saving the Alamancer from the burning building that we see later. Do you feel like spook has connected all the dots or is he kind of running on faith at this point? I think it's both because I, I think he Feels like he's connected all the dots, but at the same time, all of that information is probably coming from this external guide that he has Mm -hmm. within this Kelsier spirit that's following him around and telling him what to do and giving him so much more information than what he should know. So I I think he's simultaneously connected the dots, but not technically himself. So he's going on faith. I I think it's both in a very weird way way to answer that yes or no question that you get or that like binary question. But I think what's also kind of complex and interesting and important here is this count the skulls moment with what the implications are of that for the citizen. And it seems to me that he is not just sentencing t- sentencing these people to death and then saving the like whatever alamancers happen to be in that group it seems more like a almost like a money laundering situation where he's intentionally putting alamancers within each group so he can take them without anybody realizing it you know like it, it, it's sort of like a secret recruiting mechanism like a, a way to kind of guilt them into being a part of the army being like, I saved you. I could have killed you. I could see that. I could see that too. I was going down the 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 idea. Yeah. 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 I was kind of going down a different path, Mm -hmm. maybe a little bit more of a morbid one, but one where these alamancers die anyway, and that the citizen is being controlled by 
Ruin <laughs> and is the no. source of alamancers for Ruin for creating more <clears throat> hemallergical spikes. Hmm. So throwing Ruin into the mix too to say that he's kind of in charge of the city as well. Mm-hmm. Because we know Ruin's kind of uh, omnipotent. Like he's he's able to see and know everything that's happening. So whether or not he's been whether or not an inquisitor has come and like spiked the uh spiked the citizen, spiked Quellian and given control to ruin. I don't know. We ah, man, it's fucking complicated. There's a lot of ways this could be going. But I have a hard time believing that a separate powerful leader is being allowed to just kind of go unchecked by ruin at this point. That makes sense. I mean, and it could be just one of those things where you just expect this to all dissolve, you know, on its own and kind of sees the the writing on the wall. But I mean, a fair point. I, th- I think that there's a good, a good question to be posed there about ruins involvement here for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's not as though he's just going to leave it alone. You know, it's the end of the world. He wants his fingers and everything. He wants to enjoy this, you know, in his own way. So we then move over to Sazed in this chapter and we focus in on the population of the city of Urto, no longer being afraid of the mist because the Ska have something else to believe in. And that, of course, is Kelsier, the Lord of the Mists and the Church of the Survivor. I love that these are kind of capitalized and made this very big deal. You know, I agree with Sazed that you can almost look at Luthadel and Urto's churches as different sects of the same religion. It makes for an interesting conversation about the division that happens over time and geography, even with religions, as this has happened, you know, countless times in the real yeah, world. Of course it has. It is cool to see this like up close, real time fracturing of a religion and creating a similar but distinct entire like populace that follows it. And like it is wholly its own thing, even though. They come from the same origin and both of them are probably wrong. I don't know. It's it's one thing to see those those fractures happen historically and as like a like looking back in time, like that's what what was happening. But it's a different thing entirely to like experience the birth of a new sect of a religion. Mm-hmm. It's kind of cool. It is very cool. I mean, it it is it makes for a very interesting kind of organizational point. And I think that's why he gets so excited later. And even specifically as he's getting kind of asked questions by these miners, he kind of opens himself up to this open forum with, I think these miners and offers them six questions, I think, or something like that. And they kind of go through their questions and they ask about the survivor of flames or they mention things about the survivor of flames. Of course we knew this to be spook, well, we know this, I should say, rather a little bit later to be spook. It's not strictly, you know, you can kind of piece it together it's, at this point. Yeah, it's, um, it was pretty clear. Yeah, right. But it's made more, much more explicit when we go into the into right. kind of the next section with says and whatnot. What you, mm-hmm. would you think about it, though? The questions and the minors and everything else. I and think this idea of the second survivor. Yeah. So the questions that they're asking, I think I feel like they're doing their due diligence really and trying to get some answers from a trustworthy source or what they see as a trustworthy source. But at the same time, they, they acknowledge that says it could be lying to them as well. And mm-hmm. what's like, what's to say that he's not lying to other than the reputation of the terrorist men. And I, I, I think strangely, this points further to the idea of says being the hero of ages and being propped up as this respected leader from basically every direction. Hmm. So that's kind of what I took from from that, from them wanting to ask these questions and wanting to hear it from Sazed's mouth, even though they're acknowledging that he could be just giving them the same lie. But the fact that it's coming from him means something, even though they yeah, don't they know him. They do prop him up as a trustworthy person just because he's a terrorist man, right? Like they, mm-hmm. they very much almost, I think they explicitly say something along those lines of like, you're known to be a good people better than right. the ska or the noblemen are. So, you know, mm-hmm. more likely to trust you to begin with. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Then we move into chapter 39. So this is kind of a short one here, but 
Even now, I can barely grasp the scope of all of this. The events surrounding the world seem even larger than the final empire and the people within it. I sense shards of something from long ago, a fractured presence, something spanning the void. I have delved and searched and have only been able to come up with a single name, Nalcium. Who or what it was, I do not yet know. So that's fucking weird. This one's different. Like this, this whole logbook is different than the rest of them have been so far. This section, yeah, at least. for sure. But at the same time, the word shard comes up several times in this reading alone, and I wouldn't put much thought to it. But I know you've mentioned, I think, a podcast or a group of people called the Seventeenth Shard that deal with the Cosmere in general. So it sticks out in my brain. Anytime the word shard is used now, that's some like metagamey bullshit is the, the podcast that's coming on to round out our, you know, our, our coverage for the original trilogy of Mistborn is the shard cast. And, uh, you know, <laughs> if it's metagamey to, I mean, fact is you don't know what any of that means. Uh, that's true. The very I have no idea. I you've just, just got a highlighting name, of the term. The, yeah. the term would go right past my head. Yeah, but now it doesn't. So speculating on the rest of that outside of the fact that you're holding on to the term, what do you make of like a denalcium of maybe the idea even of shards? Like, what do you make of the rest of this logbook? I have no idea. I mean, I know that you don't have any idea. It's <laughs> it's all this is all Lucy. Time, it's so man. Lucy goosey. It, but yeah. spanning the void, it, 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 this feels extra planar or extra extra planetary at the very least like this feels removed from the surface of scadrial at this point and is looking more as like at the universe as a whole in my mind for whatever reason that's what this evokes something more grand and more unknown and more void but i don't i don't know beyond that how to nail anything down okay Mm -hmm. all right that's I mean, that's fair and reasonable. I think that this one does a really good job of setting up a much larger mystery. This is a giant question mark. You know, you, you talk about the way that like trilogies often like close up a lot of like loopholes and crumbs and stuff like that. And this feels like the firm planting of a here's a seed take with this and maybe you'll find out something about it at some point down the line. <laughs> it, it very much does not feel as though it is. It's a question asked that is not currently intended to be answered because there are so many questions around this one logbook. Yep. 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 But I do know that these answers can come books later and still be satisfying. So I'm okay with that. It's true. It's a fair point. Okay. Moving into the chapter here, I, I love Tensoon's sort of contemplation of mortality and the ability that it gives to be you know incredibly apathetic as these immortal ghost-like transformer creatures are these mimics just like that second first generation really are of the chondra there's sort of a contentedness and that's sort of generationally really hard to fight against it's the status quo and given a long enough timeline of survival i think not changing is obviously the easier and more appealing thing believing thing that kind of everything as it stands is correct there's no reason to amend or change what you're doing because you know what's worked has worked yeah uh i feel like it's more complicated than that and more complicated than apathy in general like it, it feels like they have to accept the status quo because making any wrong moves towards changing the status status quo could spell annihilation for them like it feels to me like they feel like they are walking the tightrope and any deviation could spell doom for their entire species are you saying more at the moment or in general i guess i guess in general and why, why they're so controlling of these more rebellious generations as the first and seconds i don't know maybe i'm just putting that on them and trying to like find a reason for this just so like strict conservatism i think i think you're not wrong from trying to approach it from their perspective i don't think they view anything 
I think they view the rebellious generations as potentially leading to the downfall as any old generation does to the young, right? Of the sort of, oh no, the trepidations around new cultural norms and, and, and things like that. Kind of the, the mores of advancement and progression in society. But the one thing I'll point to as sort of fuel for this thought process mm-hmm. is something that Tensoon knows about and has talked about, and that's the first contract mass su- mass suicide clause whatever that is whatever that means does that come into play with all of their decision making well we we know a little bit about the mass suicide clause we know that it's meant to be that there is a time at which it could be done and tensoon believes the time is now to do it because of the conditions that have been met okay hmm. i don't know I don't know. So they're also I, I think that's my point is that that's why I use the term apathy very specifically is it feels like they're very apathetic to any sort of change and like even unwilling to acknowledge certain realities. Yeah, I do. I do think that you're right on the side of the conservatism of kind of the younger generation or of the older generations, to the newer ones. I don't mean to downplay that. I just I think that they are also being apathetic in the way that and that's kind of the. That's what I find so interesting about this is because immortals as a concept inside of fantasy are often big puff chested hoity toity godlike beings. You know, they're like, I cannot die. I am immortal, blah, 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 blah. And I think that's what's so interesting about the Chandra is they're kind of like squeamish immortals, you know, like they're they're very afraid, fearful. Yeah. And maybe that's partly because they're not technically immortal. But they're just close to it. And maybe yeah. maybe to a certain respect, that's worse because it's like it's possible that they could be damned to feeling pain and almost dying for an unknown amount of time. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm, I've got all these half baked ideas and they're not really coming to fruition. No, it's it's all good. I was just curious on the, the technical definition of immortal, like if it includes the ability to die as a sub proclamation it's the concept of a terminal life biological immortality is different than sort of digital immortality or life extension the absence of aging would provide humans with biological immortality but not invulnerability to death by injury or disease yeah so okay. you know i mean that's not that a definition more sense. that's just a that's a supposition of the whole thing i'm not yeah so i i think i would still functionally call them immortal but vulnerable you know they're not yeah that makes more sense their vulnerability is kind of what defines their immortality then in a way because they are afraid they're naturally protective and recessive and regressive in a way that i think a lot of other immortal creatures aren't necessarily yeah yeah like you think about vampires vampires take risks risks you know they're immortal yeah traditionally can vampires survive without feeding i think that really depends on your mythos more or less but okay. there are too many, too many varieties and strains to call cogently an answer to that, I think. I mean, in real world. Oh, real world vampires. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't need anything. Matter of fact, they actually like garlic. They very frequently, after they capture a human and they drain it of its blood, they will uh, stew with garlic. Oh, there goes my theory that I'm not a vampire. I hope because all, you two capture people all, and stew their blood with Well, it was garlic. all based That's on gross. the fact that I like garlic. Uh, uh, <laughs> so you can't be a vampire because you like garlic. I see. But I now see. you've shattered that and fucking terrified. I think as a kid, I did I did some silly shit like that, like believing that I was a vampire and like being like, I don't like like I would ward away myself from garlic. Um, oh, no. but I, I definitely also believe that there was a time frame in which I was also afraid of vampires, but Bingham was more afraid of vampires. So I taught myself <laughs> to not be afraid of vampires. But I remember one night it was particularly dark in the house and I had my shower was upstairs because I had my own shower because I was the oldest kid and mm. All the lights were off. And so I went into, and I can see a little bit in the dark. I found this out much later in life, but I actually can actually see in the dark a lot better than most people, which is fucked up that I was afraid of the dark as well. Anyway, I remember going into the kitchen, grabbing a little chunk of garlic, <laughs> bringing it downstairs with me because I was afraid it was raining. I remember the whole thing very vividly. And then I just had garlic in the room for a day or two and I brought it back upstairs. <laughs> but I thought anyway. for sure that was going to end with, 
I left a, a head of garlic under my pillow for three months and suddenly it started growing. No, 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 no. My sister is the only one who did that with, with ice cream. So as previously <laughs> described it, on a devil's similarly step. started growing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So we find that Tensoon, after leaving the trust, is going out to find Orsur's spikes that he hid before turning himself in. And he also says that there is something consistent about the power of hemolurgy and maybe the blessing specifically, that it can't be regulated or changed level of strength. It just kind of is what it is, which makes sense given the way that we know we kind of know from the last logbook how spikes are built and made. I think this is that point where the previous conversation came up about the like pairs of metals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is where he says that to him inexplicably it requires two souls. And that's just, that's just how it is. And we need two spikes. They each come from one person. Bada bing, bada boom. (laughs) But it it seems I'm going to put my foot in my mouth at some point, but it seems obvious to me that those two are the paired off metals. But if that were the case, I feel like Tensoon would be a little bit more keen on that. Having spent so much time with Alamancers and Mistborn, multiple Mistborn specifically, that seems like something that if it's actually that obvious, he would have picked up on. Yeah. One of the things that's really kind of an interesting thing to grapple with with as a reader in this book is that there is almost an overwhelming amount of dramatic irony because of all of the information that we are given from the logbook, right? Like we know things from the person of whom is the hero of ages writing this logbook. We know a a ton more information. And part of the difference between this book and the previous ones is that this is questionable timeline placement information as well. So it's not like this is necessarily information of the past. It doesn't feel like that, right? You've said a couple of times that this doesn't feel like the past because of strictly the way that it references even our party. And so it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like it is. It just makes for these interesting, these difficult to parse moments where it's like, shouldn't tend soon. Like, no, that shouldn't he be a little bit more keen on that. It's like, we were just kind of, dropped the information through the logbook so we don't know really what Tensoon's keen on or not keen on yes yes and no because he talks about it specifically here he does call it, it hemolurgy but the question is how much of hemolurgy does he know and he knows what each blessing does yep and he knows that i guess i guess that's a good point This is operating under the assumption that he understands hemolurgy, which he probably doesn't. Okay. At least not fully. That's the jump in logic that I was missing. Yeah. That that makes it make a whole lot more sense to me. Yep. Yeah, because it's it's kind of like we are given so much out of context information, especially in hemolurgy. (laughs) And, you know, it's it's I I think it's reasonably done, and that's why I haven't really used the term yet, but we are kind of getting info dump from the logbook in a way. It is it is the way in which we are getting hemolurgy explained, in addition to seeing its representation in the text. So it's not like it's not also being utilized throughout the plot. I mean, we've seen an Inquisitor attempt to spike Elland. We kind of have an understanding of that. We've gone through now the spike. I mean, we haven't talked about it yet. We'll get there in a second. But the spiking of Lord Penrod with Marsh. We we get a couple of different explanations. We get this here with the blessings with Tensoon. We get the Coloss. It's not like we aren't getting hemolurgy through the story. It's just that it needs to be, it's being more narrowly explained through the logbook. Yeah. Oh, that's such a good way to describe it. An overwhelming amount of dramatic irony. Fuck, dude. Because <laughs> it does make it complicated to like parse out these sections. It's like, why don't you know? Why don't? And it's like, oh yeah, because we don't like we don't even really know like Ellen and Vin's true understanding of this until we have the meeting later here, and then mm-hmm. that's a good explanation. Okay, now we've got a foundation for what they understand versus what we understand. Okay, now we understand that they're operating on limited principles. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it just makes, exactly. It makes yeah, okay. for a complicated storytelling riddle. You asked Rob Hart mm-hmm. about the complications of writing about time travel and keeping everything yes. straight. This feels like that question ratcheted up even more. It does because in its own way, it is 
not chronological. So it poses the same kind of questions, right? Mm-hmm. Or it poses similar questions from a narrative but, standpoint. And it's balancing different levels of dramatic irony mm-hmm. across all of the like characters and the reader themselves. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like it, yeah. it, 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 it's so much information to balance. It's crazy because obviously Marsh knows the most about hemolurgy, has the most immediate experience. So, like in in a what I would call a conventional novel, you probably wouldn't have something like the logbook here. And I, I'm not saying that this should be done or should be removed, but you would probably intersperse a couple more Marsh chapters and then make Marsh be the one that's expositing the stuff about hemology through action because he is the character of whom is experiencing the abilities. Kind of like how in every other book we've seen hemology, or excuse me, not hemology, but ferrochemy through Sazed's eyes. We've seen Alamancy through Vin's eyes. It feels mm. like we should have maybe seen a little bit more we're not anywhere near the end, so I'm not trying to make this game call either. But up until this point, it's been a combination of a limited perspective with Marsh, some explanation of the of hemolurgy and its impacts with Archondra here, Ten Soon, and then you know we've we've got like a triad of like explanations. Yeah, and um, I think I can understand why you wouldn't have Marsh be the one to explain all of it because that's just giving one facet of what hemolurgy can do. In reality, they're, like you said, a triad, mm-hmm. but a triad of hemolurgy between the three races that we know. I mean, if you consider the Inquisitors a separate race, but the, the three creatures, the cre- three creations that were forged out of hemolurgy, they have very different abilities and di- very like they operate differently. So, yeah. I'm not saying you'd holistically rely on Marsh. I think we still get a good amount of we're getting some at the very least of of this point from Tensoon. But I think that our bulk experience with hemolurgy would be from Marsh in a book that didn't use the logbook. That's fair. Speaking of, though, I'm curious what this writing process was and if Branderson wrote the text that the logbook was based on first or separately and slotted in those sections after the chapters were written. I don't remember about the logbook. I do know that all of the POVs were written separately and then pieced together. Oh, that's uh, even so. Cooler. He basically wrote them as individual stories and then wove the story together. Okay. So that there was enough, there was enough balance in different parts of each person's perspective to make it so that you didn't drop any of the individual threads of each of the stories. Mm hmm. That's super cool. Yeah. In that case, I don't think it would make any sense for those logbooks, logbook chapters to be written like piecemeal. No, I think, I think it would think have it would to make... be written front to back to, to your yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Or even potentially written for the chapter. Like after he did all the weaving, he may have just written them for the chapter. Not, not clear. I, I haven't listened to yeah. an interview on that specifically, but uh, okay. But I do know that the rest of the book was constructed that way, where it was partitioned off into the different kind of subsections. It's super cool. So, yeah. This is getting into the weeds and way off topic, but I think we were pretty on topic. Like at the very least, a very interesting, you know, side tangent about the construction of the book, which is, you know, something that we we often think and talk about. So mm-hmm. I don't um I don't feel too bad. I hope you at home enjoy that more than you enjoyed my garlic basement story. <laughs> garlic vampire running story. Cool. So to round out this chapter, I'm just mentioning about, we were talking about the blessings and kind of what that does, but Tatin soon now with these additional blessings is quote now potentially the most powerful Chandra alive. I, I add potentially, he says that he's the most powerful Chandra alive. Um, mm-hmm. Runs out to find the one person that he thinks could help with this contract conundrum. That, of course, being the mother, the replacement for the father, Vin. Yes, which we don't have an explicit text-based backup on, or like rule-based backup, logic-wise, of why he believes Vin to be the mother, other than just kind of, she killed the father, right? Or was there a specific passage that he was pointing to? 
Well, I, I think that what he was trying to insinuate is because she killed him and she has all of the abilities of the old Mistborn like him. She in turn should be considered the mother. Yeah. So not right. just because of her ability to kill, but because of her ability to control. Okay. So you put on the, the term potentially, but like you said, he says that he's the most powerful Condra alive at mm-hmm. this point. But at the same time, just before this talks about how other Chandra have stolen blessings from, from their kin. Does that mean that that sort of process was done maybe in the past long ago and mostly forgotten? And like any of them had been killed at this point. I think that's the implication. I think that's the implication is that he is the most powerful because no one has done it in so long, which is part of the reason that he was being tried. So, egregiously and explicitly or rather judged because it wasn't really a trial right. so yeah I, I believe that's why he cites this is because he doesn't believe that anyone else is rocking multiple potencies yeah everyone else only has one piercing he's got he's got two well they've got or four so it's important to note they have one to give them sentience i believe this is explained in a logbook this week they have one to give them sentience and then they're given the additional blessing of which is a pair of spikes I didn't quite get that. We'll get there when we get to the, but we'll get there. Okay. It may have been last week's I'll I'll double check, but I'll make sure that I I clarify that information. It may, I I may even be slightly wrong. It might just be the first spike within the blessing set gives that, but I don't think that's the case. I feel like it's a different spike. Okay. I'll have to reapproach that because I understood it as when they got their blessing, that's when they also got sentience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's to that point. Maybe it is the two spikes that are their blessing and it's the first spike, but I swear we can look at it again when we, when we get to it. Yeah. I'm double checking memory banks for other things too. And I'm trying to remember how that impacts things, scanning the memory banks like I'm C3PO or some bullshit with a really slow processor. (laughs) Scanning, scanning, scanning. Cool. But yeah, I mean, I I think to the, the end all be all point here being that I think he is notably the most powerful conjure alive, probably given that it's implied that no one else has multiple shingies 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 cool all right so with that we get into chapter 40 we've got our logbook here originally we assumed that a coloss was a combination of two people into one that was wrong coloss are not the melding of two people but five as evidenced by the four spikes needed to make them not five bodies of course but five souls each pair of spikes grants the chondra what the chondra would call the blessing of potency. However, each spike also distorts the coloss body a little bit more, making it increasingly inhuman. Such is the cost of hemolurgy. So, this gets even more complicated now. Mm-hmm. We talked about this this logbook entry explicitly earlier when talking about human, but now this isn't something similar to the blessing of potency. It is what the chondra would call the blessing of potency. So that blessing seemingly is coming from a single spike from a single person, as opposed to the way that the Chandra can achieve that blessing through two spikes and two people. Each pair of spikes grant what the Chandra would call the blessing of potency. However, each each pair, each pair. Yeah. So it's, it's double the potency. Okay. Yep. 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 Okay, cool. For me, this makes me question that if you had a more, if you had one more potent spike, would you be able to still make a coloss? You know, like if you had, they, they say there's no variability in the strength though on the, on the spikes on normal humans. Yeah, you're right. And on the coloss themselves. Yes. Because there's no variability on the, yes, yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. That's all, that's all derived from the, the person that is spiked. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Like, because it's a normal person, right? I, I neglected that information when I was saying, I wonder if you could use a different spike to make a coloss. It's like, no, because it actually is this specific combination of the blessing and potency because of the, the soul's body potency issue. But that said, if you were to use a different blessing, hmm. Oh, also doesn't it say that the blessing of potency is rarely used for the col or for the chondra? No, it's not potency. It's acuity. Stability. Stability. Yep. Blessing of stability. Okay. 
so there's that theory. I was thinking, oh no, all those all those spikes are going to the coloss, not the chondra. That's why. But mm. never mind. There there is a question of could you make coloss out of other spikes? Or if you were to use other spikes, what would they be? Yeah. Right. What would what would it yield? Are there any other creatures that could be created with different spikes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we open up this chapter with literally the line, no one knows precisely how inquisitors are made. And Ellen, the first rule of being an adult is not to use declarative 100% statements because there are people of whom know how inquisitors are made. They're inquisitors. (laughs) They're alive and they're people too. (laughs) And they're doing it. And they're doing it. <laughs> How dare you use a 100% authoritative declarative statement yep. with no room for error, you fool. Someone likely knows how. But we break open this chapter through Ellen's perspective at a strategy meeting like we've seen before by talking about Inquisitors and potentially how they are made. But also t- he touches upon another point of contention, that of the irregularity in the nature that is the regular rate at which the myths seem to take people. It's almost as though the mists are intelligent, but Norden also brings to attention a much more critical fact about the Inquisitors that gets the room going as well, that many are one. Yeah. So know what this made me think of? Mm -hmm. It made me really uncomfortable. Yeah. Do you remember this conversation after Vin escaped the Inquisitors? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, Crossland, why didn't they just kill her? That seems like that would have been a lot easier. You're like, hmm, yeah, PJ, that seems weird. I don't know. Now I have my answer. Uh (laughs) Which is that all all along, the reason that they aren't strictly going in and killing people and the reason they go through the the difficulty of hunting these people down is because Ska Misting and Alamancers, and there's even the argument that kind of the Lord Ruler wants this to happen, feeds the Inquisitor army. Mm Mm-hmm. And I guess it seems to be both directions. Like Vin would become a very, very powerful Inquisitor, but could also produce a very powerful Inquisitor if used Mm -hmm. as like the source for the spike, right? Like it it could be either way. True. I think what's so fascinating about the way that Inquisitors are made is it seems based on the experience that we have from Marsh, they tend to take Seekers in part because it enhances their ability to seek. You know, this is specifically mentioned in a logbook when they're spiked and go through the inquisitorial process or being turned into an inquisitor. But on top of that, it also means that like seekers themselves or like any sort of low misting or things like that, they are kind of reliant or maybe seeking more power, like actually after something else. And that's why they're joining the Canton to begin with. And so they're a little bit more they behave a little bit more in line with what's expected. But like someone like Vin, you know, being spiked doesn't guarantee that you'd behave that way, you know? So like you you might steal her powers as opposed to try to turn her into an inquisitor. Until you bring into the idea that they can be controlled and subdued. Right. Right. Yeah. I guess the the Lord rule. This is the difference between the Lord Ruler's build versus what Ruin's doing, right? Ruin really doesn't give a shit because he can control them, no problem. Um, mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the Lord Ruler was not exerting that same influence, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, he created loyalty, so it's a little bit of a difference in perspective there. But it does, like you said, it does make for that uncomfortable revelation of like, huh. I wonder why that didn't work all the way back in episode one. And I just had to kind of very casually dance around it. Did you like my really uncanny impression? It was very uncanny. It actually, it frightened me how close you get to my voice there. That was Mm -hmm. almost a mirror image. I was really shocked. I don't know if I can get shrill enough, but I'm close. Moving on. We then (laughs) get to talk about more hemolytic theory, uh, talking about the creation of the Coloss and this full idea of the Coloss themselves. Ham even takes it a step further to give it a role, drawing powers from someone else's body. We've said stealing, things like that, but this idea that it is truly a a thing of theft. We get even further clarification on this during a later logbook, but overall, how are you feeling about the different points pertaining to hemolurgy and the connection of our three hemolurgic creatures, as well as the control exerted over them maybe specifically i feel like we've hit on everything else pretty decently but the control aspect is one that i'm curious about the wording that ham used there 
mm-hmm. genuinely help me nail it down and help literally me like, nail really it down because they're it. like spikes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, pun. it still felt a little bit abstract as far as the mechanics go. And that perspective from ham made it make a lot more sense to me. And who knows if that's accurate or if it's like a partial truth or a partial understanding of it. But at the very least, I've got something concrete to really kind of push against in my seat, in my search for knowledge, in my search for understanding. Yeah, I, I feel like it's nice because it's a textual way to be, you know, how in a movie you have someone who says something obviously to communicate something that may have been missed by the audience ham is kind of doing that heavy lifting here without being so ham fisted as a movie might be um Uh, yeah that was my pun you see (laughs) we had to get two puns in on this one but i I, but i seriously think that i think that he puts a much finer point on it without it also coming off as demeaning because he does he does really kind of connect the dots of the idea of it being taken from someone else's body, not just sort of the generic term of stealing. This is further made a point when we go into Marsh's perspective later, but you know, mm-hmm. right now where we're at in, in kind of a read through and discussion, this is a great, great latching in point to really get it. And then to see it done is kind of the, you know, the later bit. So moving on from kind of the planning and the hemological discussion, Demu brings up an interesting point in perspective, bringing into the focus the mist fallen or the nickname that's been given to the sort of disintegrated part of the army who survived the mist. They're kind of being treated poorly and improperly, sort of like lepers since they had survived this disease as though it might pass on to others. Ellen makes orders to, for the time being, for them to continue to be sort of and operate as separate groups what do you make of kind of this decision this decision makes sense to me in that reintegrating them into the fold will make for a less than cohesive group at this point a less than cohesive Mm -hmm. army they need time they need to have guaranteed time in order to like get everybody to trust them so for that reason not knowing how long it's going to be before they're needed it makes total sense to separate them out i think what that means going forward they'll never actually get back like integrated back in they'll become this sort of separate task force and uh sort of sub sub army that'll be used separately but beyond that that's my guess (laughs) like i don't know okay but it, it makes sense to me that that decision would be made given the parameters that were set forward yeah, I I feel like that's a good a good call. You know, it's 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 an unfortunate thing of course that they're kind of separated in this way, but we really don't have an understanding of what's happening to them. Like and they don't really know. We don't really know why or what. We just know that they did survive. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, it seems overreaching because we know that afterwards we haven't seen any sort of residual, you know, hangover between. It's very much superstition leading the way. But yeah. In a society like this, superstition does typically lead the way. And is strangely important. Like, these superstitions are founded a lot of the time, even when they don't seem like they should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's some basis for their founding. Like, we treat a lot of the things that are going on this personally, as we read the story, as, like, pseudoscience in the way that we approach the magic system and the way that a lot of this is kind of written is it feels like there's a scientific backing to anything. There are rules. There's a a physics system. There's a way that everything kind of purports to make sense. And so Mm -hmm. for us, we can, we can kind of see that at a 10,000 foot view, but for some of the characters, you know, it's, it's dramatic irony, (laughs) you know, it's we're, we're working out a meta and they're kind of just dealing with the information as it's parsed to them. Right. They're living lives. We're just seeing him. So Mm -hmm. we meet a messenger, Conrad, and we receive word that Penrod has been unable to keep complete control of Luthadel. This obviously weighs on Ellen as he snaps as he had expected to be resupplied by the capital city. This is obviously kind of an unfortunate moment for Ellen as a leader, I think, not because he snaps necessarily, but because he is undermined once again and doesn't know how to react to that and feels like if he had absolute control, it would be okay. 
my thought on this is that this is the first real tangible thing that you can point to and say this is because of ruins intervention that's what this feels like to me like these coloss are the everything is happening to keep all flow of information away from the two factions of this like sundered government at this point Mm -hmm. and separating them will will make it easier for them to fall so this feels like those three messengers fell to ruin effectively and it was just dumb luck that conrad got through yeah, and subsequently also the three cities that fell, right? Like the three storage supplies that Marsh burned, um, which mm-hmm. caused the shortage in the first place. So, right, yeah, it does lead to leads us to an interesting point. And I, I think it's a fair point to point to this being one of the first direct implications that we can really see and feel of Ruin's influence being exerted. Right. From Ellen's perspective. I mean, obviously, from Marsh, we know that things have been happening, but yeah. <laughs> There's a lot yeah. more hands in those pies. Right, right. Ellen's, uh, not Ellen, Ruins, many spectral hands are in all the pies. He's got a mm-hmm. finger in every pie. Cow pies. Do they have cows? I don't know that they have cows. Don't want to make an assumption. Do they ever mention beef? I don't think so. Hmm. I think food is kept rather loosey-goosey in, in this story. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's also kept pretty uh, sparse <laughs> in general from yeah yeah i mean fair point Um, from a stockpile standpoint yes yes also that Mm -hmm. so there's a fascinating layer of the story that gets added on as we wander back to vin's perspective she recalls that anything said aloud can be heard by ruin and therefore used and that perhaps ellen's pattern that he's noticing is nothing more than this basic manipulation of semi-omnipotent access to information it makes ruin a really tough foe to fight against which is kind of what we've been talking about right like this is what makes this almost impossible um i know and this is something that we talked about last week i think i don't remember if it was on air or off air or what but trying to find some way to communicate through through some sort of maybe like obfuscated code like I don't know, saying I, I've thought a lot about this on how they could do this. And if they were to say a date and then a page number, for example, and if they both know that on that date, Ellen was reading this book and they can like find the words on that page number, something like that, like some sort of code that uses their memory as the sort of relaying of information that they can then go and like act upon. But then I don't know if them reading that book translates the information to ruin, you know, like there's a lot of complicated mechanics of this omnipotent foe. And how does the, like what, what, what is the level of information that he can, or it can obtain through words and actions i i think that to your point um memory would be one of the few things that they could play with that they could be like remember the first date and then they could like ref like in theory they could communicate through trust that the other knows what they're talking about you know and like right but then that still requires them to go probably follow up on something that's pointed to by the first date you know i guess i i'm confused as to are you so I'm saying like they would use first date as a pointer to information. Sure. I don't even think that you would need to go that far as a, as a okay. stretch. And okay. I think you could remove the potential for ruins influence by not stretching that far. I okay. see. I see what you're saying, suggesting that pointer first date. Here's the book that Ellen was reading and then try to figure out some way to communicate a page number or what have you or something, something along that line. Yeah, mm-hmm. but you're right. It maybe doesn't have to be that complicated. Right. Instead, I think we can just say this is making Vin lean into the idea that trust is the most important thing at the moment, which is a fascinating turn. More important from a character building standpoint, but maybe less important from an army building standpoint. (laughs) I mean, 
I'm trusting in each other's actions without saying it. That that's like trusting the individual yeah. to make the right choice, right? And You're right. this is to say that Vin as an individual can make the right choice. The difficulty of trying to even relay simple commands to an army of many people yeah. is possibly difficult. <laughs> but you you bring up a very good point in that Vin has had trust issues from the jump mm-hmm. and this gives like a dire consequence for not trusting Mm -hmm. so seeing that she's able to do this and then like i said this this section itself has made me think of the first book a lot so going back to that and seeing this scared little budding mistborn that can't trust anybody and comparing it to this confident badass woman who has to trust Hmm. And is able to do it, no problem, because Ellen's a G. <laughs> you know, like it, it, yeah. it's a huge right. growth mm-hmm. from Vin, and it, mm-hmm. just kind of being forced to face that growth is cool. Ellen is a G. I mean, her <laughs> husband, definitely a G for sure. Yeah, you're right. Good call. Good call. I don't know why I doubted you. I mean, fair, fair point. You're right, though. It does, it does add for that layer of like, this is this is the this is growth this is you know beginning to end this is showing that hey i now have the ability to trust i have changed and i can make decisions and i can place my faith in people to do the right thing individuals that i know and believe in Mm -hmm. yeah so yeah we leave this chapter with vin questioning the mists and why they joined her in the first book to fuel her power but have abandoned her since of course she doesn't meta reference the first book but you know when she was fighting the lord ruler (laughs) you know i remember two books ago (laughs) two books ago no so the one thing that i can point to that's different now than before and i guess i don't necessarily know that for sure because i can't recall was she burning atium with the lord ruler or did they even know about atium yet they knew about A-Team for sure, because that was used to fight the Inquisitor long before the duel. Right. Um, yep, yep, yep. But I don't think she was burning ATM at the time. I think she burned mal ATM to throw him off because he saw himself or she saw projections of him or they both did. Um, right. But that was not when she drew upon the mists. Right. I All I was thinking was... Maybe it could be tied to ATM somehow, because sure. that's something that's explicitly missing from her toolkit right now. Sure. Okay. I don't remember if she's had ATM while trying to figure out this problem. Sure. Yeah. That's a good question. But good point. I think I touched on this before. The vin or uh, the mist being an extension of ruin, mm-hmm. potentially. And how it was leaning into her and like it wanted to help her up until killing the Lord ruler and really up until releasing ruin was by design. Ruin was trying to help Vin defeat the Lord ruler and release him. Yeah. And potentially trying to help Kelsier do it first. Right. Yeah. But now Vin is at odds with ruin. So why would, why would ruin help Vin at all? So the miss being sentient and aligned with ruin answers those questions of why she's not able to call upon it now and why she was then. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is a satisfactory answer. Okay. All right. With that, we go to chapter 41. We've got our logbook, mostly talking about hemologic spites and kind of their impact on biology here. But as we go, we read it. Hemologic spikes change people physically depending on which powers are granted, where the spike is placed, and how many spikes someone has. Inquisitors, for instance, are changed drastically from the humans they used to be. Their hearts are in different places from those of humans, and their brains rearrange to accommodate the lengths of metal jabbed through their eyes. Colossus are changed in even more drastic ways. One might think that Chondra are the most changed of all. However, one must remember that new Chondra are made from mist wraiths and not humans. The spikes worn by Chondra cause only a small transformation in their hosts, leaving their bodies mostly like that of a mist wraith, but allowing their minds to begin working. Ironically, while the spike dehumanizes the Coloss, they give a measure of humanity to the Chondra. That one to me feels the most like a uh, 
David Attenborough like reading. Yeah, this uh, leaving feels... their bodies mostly like that of a mistwraith, but allowing their minds to begin working. Ironically, while the spike dehumanizes the Kolos, they give a measure of humanity to the Chondra. This one simultaneous, like first of all, that was very well done. Thank you. Like I applaud you for that <laughs> impression. But this one Too also feels. Earth. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, you're right. This one feels less certain than a lot of the logbooks have. Like it's not speaking from a place of authority as much as it is speaking on what we know so far kind of deal. Mm -hmm. So that gives, that gives a sort of level of mortality and of humanity to the writer of this logbook comparatively. But I don't know. We also know it to be the hero of ages and to have experienced untenable power and knowledge so i don't know maybe it's just the way it was written that it feels less certain yeah i don't know that i can i can fully respond to you there that's fine um just given kind of the the sort of degree of certainty is is a giant question I, and i i guess that is the way that i can't answer the degree of certainty of this character is a giant question that constantly is kind of pulled pulled on you know backward and forward like does this person have absolute knowledge or do they potentially lack some knowledge in some areas and it seems like it's kind of a give and a take it does feel like we continue to when when this character questions something it does feel like we continue to explore it deeper deeper and deeper as though they do have more knowledge and they just aren't giving it up kind of at the mm-hmm. pace that the log books happen um yeah <laughs> so it's it's hard to quantify yeah yeah it is cool any anything else on the like inquisitors and the spikes themselves on sort of the way that they are changed you know i think that it's one of the interesting things that i caught is that they used to be humans this does add that clarification that they are something different now that's true that's a good point they're they're not so yeah so my my comment earlier about calling them a different race Mm -hmm. accurate in this sense yeah species Um, race whichever pertains more accurately regardless the fact that the heart changes positions seems really odd to me. I don't, I'm sure there's a reason. I trust there's a reason, but it doesn't, like, it, it feels so removed from any logical understanding of the changes that they've undergone so far that I'm like, all right, but why? <laughs> Yeah, and we we only know a limited amount about like where Inquisitors get spiked. Obviously, we know the eyes. We know that they have the one that is kind of the critical one that they can pull out of the back, right? That's kind of spiked through their center and a couple of others, you know, Mm -hmm. that are kind of here or there, depending on the scenes themselves. But yeah, I think the the one in the back they refer to as the linchpin, right? Yes, I think that's how what Vin and Ellen both referred to it as at the beginning of this and even in the in the first book. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, linchpin spike, which makes sense. So I like how excited says it is at the beginning of this chapter regarding this potential for this new survivor of flames. It's it's really wonderful to see just for a moment the way the man's mind spins when confronted with new potential. I think that's how I describe like what says it gets excited about is is potentially something new. Mm-hmm. You know, what what do you make of Ariane Breeze and says it's early takes on this new survivor and the sort of follow-up conversation therein so my main appreciation as you mentioned is sazid's enthusiasm here Mm -hmm. and this return to form as this religious scholar and he gets kind of caught up but at a certain point he catches himself and like reminds himself actively that he's supposed to be a sad boy yeah he (laughs) kind of shuts himself down he does he does He's like, no, I shouldn't be. Like, it, it, it's almost like he's. It makes it feel so much less like apathy and more like punishment. That's a fair point. Like it's it's more self flagellation. Yeah, and and forcing himself to not care about religions anymore, and forcing himself to 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 give it up. But he slip it like he very quickly slips into this like enthusiastic scholar brain. So it gives this level of complexity to what he's actually feeling right now, because we've, we've lived in his head Mm -hmm. and we understand to a certain extent, or at least I thought we understood how he, how he was thinking about these religions, but maybe it's deep rooted enough that he's actually 
just actively like suppressing his desire to to explore those thoughts yeah i i think i I really like the idea of this being like self-flagellation it's kind of profoundly sad especially as you think about like <sighs> tindwell wouldn't have wanted this for him you know no of course not would have wanted him Do to you- confront the religion thing but in the long run maybe but like never would have demanded that he change himself or self-flagellate in this way just working off of that presupposition that i'm right mm-hmm and that, that that's what this is. Does that make him less of a sad boy or more of a sad boy? I think it makes him more of a sad boy. <laughs> Cause he's choosing to do it to himself when he shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's got to make him more of a sad boy. I think. What do you think? I think you're right. Yeah. I think it's more. It's so sad. I just want to see, mm-hmm. say, is it happy? I just want to see him smile. <laughs> Like he does in this chapter, damn it. It's so nice because Has it's like he just ever a moment. smiled. Yeah, he smiled and like expressed happiness and like even giggled from time to time. So Yeah, that's true. Even giggled. He even did a giggle. So we go from there and we move back to Spook's, Spook's perspective with Kelsier whispering in his ear again. And our boy also hasn't slept outside of a few hours in the last six days, meaning that he's also likely began a pewter drag of his own. I see you, Brandon Sanderson, laying those little foundational <laughs> tacks for me to step on. Kelsier pushes him <laughs> to save those people and asks the all important question what would kelsier do and this was a joke that we made and i forgot that it was textual <laughs> yeah um, kind of i mean here's here's something that can kind of point to this being the real kelsier right mm-hmm. he's a bit of an egotist <laughs> just a little bit yeah just a little bit but um that was true in corporeal form as well so mm-hmm. you know that's that's I uh, I don't know. <laughs> what would Kelsier do? Man, it is. We did make that joke, didn't we? We did. We did. We we said especially and it was like after he died, it became this question in the second book of like what would Kelsier do from Vin's perspective as well? Like she was constantly mm-hmm. kind of asking that question and she, it was the wrong question because she shouldn't have been asking what would Kelsier do so much as she should have been of I've been approaching it from her own perspective, which is the realization that she comes to at the end of the first novel, which is that, Hey, I treat people. Well, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. why Gory Dell is still alive and useful. Right. So, yeah. Okay, cool. So we also get a picture of Quellian's plans in these burning buildings. He kills the ska, but always extracts the an- alamancer as they're fall- far too valuable as we kind of were able Not to make a piece together. At this point, they're mostly Scott. I know. I'm fucking yeah. with you. Yeah. According to Quellian, they're not. But at this point, they're mostly Scott. You know, it kind of further proves that this man is an absolutely atrocious hypocrite, right? Because he's burning these people alive and then saving the Alamancer out of a secret tunnel. But Spook in this moment has be- has to begin to fight. And after a shout of kill them from Kelsier, he begins to fight to free the Ska from these guards in an epic combat, even managing his to work his way out of a hostage situation. The whole thing is a brilliant action scene. I absolutely love the action scene. Man, like I feel so good about my like constant poking at the idea that this is Zane's God, because this is, this feels so much more obvious now that this would be the same entity with the kill them expletive. That does, it does rem- feel remarkably similar to the way that God shouted, kill yeah, them, kill them, kill them. Yep. You could kill them. You could kill them all. <clears throat> it just, it feels too close. But at the same time, that's making me think again, maybe both are correct. Maybe this is, maybe this is Kelsier. And Kelsier was also God for Zane, which has way different implications. But. I want to explore those implications. We know textually that Vin was like, he never told Zane to kill Vin. And that was what made Vin different. He was primarily dealing with noblemen. He was constantly dealing with Straff, his father. And God was perpetually telling him to kill Straff. I'd I'd really have to go back and look more specifically at, zane's interactions with god but i think it was mostly just kill him 
and uh, don't kill him. Okay. Follow up question. What would be the methodology by which this is happening to these two characters? Why? Oh, uh, Zane has a spike in him. He is being controlled or influenced hemolurgically. I think that's it. I mean, your term is correct, but I think or your the word you said is correct. However, I don't know if that's the proper way of pinpointing it, if that makes sense. It's probably the best we can do right now. So we'll call it as it is. Hemologically. And Spook also has metal embedded in him and is being actively told not to take it out. The tip of that sword. Mm. Mm. Because it makes him stronger. It proves his overcoming of adversity. or Whatever the fuck he told him. It it do. It do be that way, though. So I guess the other question is straight up. Is this ruin? Do you think it would be preservation? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> because hemolurgy is of ruin. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have no further answers. I have exhausted my current like thought process on it. Okay. Yeah. You know, I do want to say, since you pointed out something, never mind. Okay. I do want to say that all those details are very curious, though. They are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. 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 Interesting. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it does make for an interesting comparison to think about Zane's God and Kelsier that's speaking in his head. Although Kelsier is saying a lot more than just kill them. A little bit more robustly. Communicating more. Spook's just smarter. Uh, I, I mean, you know, I don't need the embodiment of this god voice to tell or explain that to me zane it's pretty 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 damaged um, as far as it went pretty hard to call out intelligence with him because it was like oh boy you just have issues our, i believe our you would have gone and killed everybody anyway yeah our mall goth with issues cool <laughs> So we cut from that incredible scene of action of which we didn't talk about at all. Very cool. Very neat. Love spooks swooping around with some daggers and the dueling cane oh, and hitting yeah. people. It's so cool. That um, was super cool. <laughs> it's so cool. It's it's very, again, this idea of working within the limitations of a couple of powers is almost more interesting because it feels like there's more of a threat. Um, mm-hmm. Like the, This is exactly what spook always wanted to be. Mm -hmm. he wanted to be relevant and important and strong and like memorable and not like falling into obscurity or into the into the shadows like this is exactly what he was striving for and exactly Mm -hmm. what he was longing for when kind of feeling on the outside when looking at vin and her position as this misborn so it's heartwarming to a certain extent to see him realize that dream yeah Yeah, totally it is it is a great moment of revelation to be like he is he's here he is doing what we want he what he's want to do what he sought to do for books now be that hero grow into that Mm -hmm. position right so we cut from spook to says it Orian and breeze discussing the awful things that Quillian was doing as well as Orian's all romantic capabilities when says it recognizes spook as this new survivor of flames that emerges from the burning ruins with a girl in his arms and his cape blows away in the wind clearly revealing his face with a little bandage over top of his eyes I'm Batman. And looks literally Batman or daredevil <laughs> yeah <laughs> But I mean, you have to admit that that imagery and that scene is super powerful, even before they realize mm-hmm. who Spook was. Right, right. Like, that's got to look super fucking cool. Mm-hmm. It was striking and fascinating to them before they knew that it was Spook. Exactly. It's when that hood blows back that says it really puts it together. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a great moment. It feels... This feels very cinematic. It feels literally beat for beat, like exactly what you'd expect, which nothing wrong with that. But it is beat for beat exactly what you'd expect, <laughs> which is sometimes on the nose is really good. And I think at this time it's done very well. Yeah, I've yeah, definitely seen this not pan out for people, but I do like it here. 
So yeah. the crowd, of course, is erupting after this sort of reveal and he comes out and this is because of all Rian's rioting. They burst into action movement, kind of allowing for Spook to get make his getaway and kind of flow around the crowd, giving Spook this perfect opportunity to make it away with this girl in his arms while Breeze calms them down just in time to prevent any further bloodshed so they don't actually turn into a riot from all Rian's rioting. It's, it's a great moment of seeing kind of the ebb and flow of the capability of these two emotional alamancers and why they also make such a powerful pair Mm -hmm. they do they they're so intuitive and play off each other super well Mm -hmm. imagine if they were part of a thieving crew and they were more organized how cool that could be and how much they would get like get done i think they'd be incredibly effective as you can Mm -hmm. even like if you remember back to the first book the way that breeze was able to orchestrate a room of you know, emotional animal answers to like do just the two of them have an intuitive, like it sounds weird to say, but almost like wonder twin esque ability to like <laughs> ebb and flow together. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. Mm-hmm. To know what the other is doing and what needs to be done. So cool. All right. Well, that is all for chapter 41. We go into chapter 42 here. We've got our log book, of course, another long book. I think that the Coloss were more intelligent than we wanted to give them credit for being. For instance, originally, they only used the spikes the Lord Ruler gave them to make new members. He would provide the metal and an unfortunate ska captives, and the Coloss would create new recruits. At the Lord Ruler's death, then, the Coloss would quickly have died out. This was how he had designed them. If they got free from his control, he expected them to kill themselves off and end their own rampage. However, they somehow made the deduction that the spikes their bodies of the fallen coloss could be harvested then reused they then no longer required a fresh supply of spikes i often wonder what effect the constant reuse of spikes had on their population a spike can only hold so much of a hemolytic charge so they could not create spikes that granted infinite strength no matter how many people those spikes killed and drew power from however did the repeated use of the spikes perhaps bring more humanity to the coloss they made So I think really the most interesting part of this is that, A, they were designed this way, right? Like they were designed to basically self-destruct upon death because they kind of feel like the nuclear option for control. That was kind of the way the Lord Ruler used them, more or less, trying to keep them away from population centers and use them predominantly as a thing to quell uprisings and sort of the emergency pull switch more than anything else. But I really like the question that's posed in the end about the repeated use of spikes in the way that like it might hemallergic, like spiking so many people so many times doesn't change the capability of spiking a normal person, but might impart more of their soul quote, because you're you're taking more of preservation into the spike in its own way or like you're kind of carrying forward more of preservation. I guess I took it the other way. In that it became less effective in masking the humanity that it was over, like overshadowing. Like, it okay. still gave the same powers, but it didn't, because it, it would be the soul of the person that's remaining, like the the last person, not the not the person that the spikes came from. But yeah, I guess my assumption relies on the idea. So it would be, it would be additive as like the person who ends up getting spiked maintains spikes more of their in. humanity. Hmm. Yes, I, I agree with you in concept. I'm just trying to figure out how that actually works. Same. <laughs> All right. The difference is I know more. Um, I know. <laughs> and I'm still trying to figure out how it works. I feel like it's got to be additive. So like, when it spikes somebody, it like takes on some of that humanity? And oh, then yeah, for sure. Most definitely. Like it embodies some of the spirit. It? Yes, yes. Okay. And, and basically what that means, though, is that because it takes four of these spikes to make one coloss, when that coloss dies, those four spikes also have a chunk or a little bit of that coloss in them, you know, so that's an additional bit of humanity. And then you do another coloss and then that coloss dies. And so that's another bit of humanity imparted in those four sparks. So spikes. So over enough time, you would eventually arrive at a much more human like coloss, at least in but- cognition or spirit in cognition but not in like individual specific memories because it's all no. just a fractured bit of tons of different humans so it's not like oh i can almost remember what my name was in life because it's no it's no it's like totally a, in spirit jigsaw of that's a great way of putting it spirits. an incomplete jigsaw where the puzzle the puzzle pieces would never fit because um, they're all from the, different puzzles 
Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. The, the <laughs> Colossus are the world's worst jigsaw. <laughs> Scadrill's worst jigsaw. Yeah. No. I feel like that makes the most sense. I feel like it's a good way. Good way to think okay. about it. That's fair. Cool. Cool. So we're, we obviously are in chapter 42 now, and this is the Marsh chapter, right? And ah, uh, Marsh is set loose in Luthadel and on the Empire. He'd he'd been the one as Rune's right hand who had upset the balance of the food stores and the rebellion in the central dominance. But Marsh, er, you know, Rune has <laughs> greater plans and even whispers to us a hint that Rune is looking for something that preservation took from him and hid. So I've got a theory. We are operating on this information from the logbook and let's take it as outside looking in knows more than ruin and preservation themselves do. And ruins looking for something that preservation hid. We know from the logbook that preservation has like essentially a fracture of itself spread amongst all of humanity and is essentially the source of life for humanity based on how I understood it. Mm -hmm. I think that's what preservation hid from ruin was this source of power and hid it by distributing it amongst this new sentient life. So what are you thinking it's looking for or is yeah, is every little bit of preservation that's within humanity. Hmm collectively is what preservation is hiding from ruin do you think that he would key in that all from hemallergic spikes or anything like that do you think that he would probably so that breaks okay. down my argument but. i mean i'm not i'm not saying i don't know that it necessarily does i'm just saying that i mean maybe maybe the reality is is that he has to spike everyone and so he's going after important people first you know like i'm, I'm not dismantling that i was just trying to you know or maybe maybe ruin doesn't quite understand what it's looking for it looks yeah. it knows it's looking for some right. immeasurable amount of power and doesn't realize oh it's distributed across all of humanity yeah i i think especially critical that it doesn't know what it's looking for that's that's the biggest thing it, to pull away i think that would this. have to be the case if that yeah. were the, right if i were right in that argument so mm-hmm yeah it's an interesting point it's interesting to think about this game of gods you know it's kind of going on in the background of this world forever so marsh quickly makes his way to penrod's room and discusses something small about hemallergy that size doesn't strictly matter and that a small spike can be as effective as a massive spike in many cases it's you know about how you use it you know (laughs) motion of the ocean and all that Uh, (laughs) something like that i don't know (laughs) so i feel like they mentioned within this section the idea was that the size of it determined how long it could hold on to power before all the power was diffused out of it right so in this case a smaller spike just meant less of an less of a chance of imparting powers upon them but still allowing them to be kind of controlled I felt like that was mentioned something to that extent. I thought it was closer to time. Give me one second here. I have well, this the amount of up. time, like it, it diffused its power over time. And I thought the bigger the spike, the longer it could hold on to that power, but they didn't necessarily want it to hold on to that power for, for like Marsh's case here. He wasn't made to be in, he wasn't to be made into an inquisitor. He would only get a single small spike, one that had been made days ago and been allowed to sit outside a body, leaking power all that time. There's another thing that, though that I know that you're talking about. So the spike size was in this case immaterial, just as a pinch of metal dust could feel allomancy for a time or a small ring could hold a small fair chemical charge, a rather small bit of metal could work for hemallergy. Inquisitor spikes were made large to be intimidating, but a small pin could in many instances be just as effective as a massive spike. It depended on how long one wanted to leave the spike outside of a person's body after using it to kill someone. Okay. So a big spike would hold the power for longer that's my understanding of it based on those two passages but Uh uh-huh yeah that seems to be right big spike would hold the power for longer leaking it the smaller spike would leak the power at a faster rate yielding it Mm. effectively powerless by the time it's actually you know stabbed into him right so that makes sense 
which is also why they do the fresh spike directly through a person to steal the power right away so that it is it is at its most powerful when they you know get them get them um you know and, and this obviously recalls the day that he himself was spiked this happens of course before kind of the penrod thing a spike went right through a woman's heart and into his eye and how that continued and continued for a long stretch of time until he got each of those eight base spikes plus a couple of extra pairs to you know pair things off like the eyes of course and was turned into this inquisitor in the way that the room was met left in this gory disgusting mess that we found and we found that body that we thought was marsh's that wasn't and it was actually someone else who was turned into mush to give marsh these hemolurgy powers it's fucking terrible but Mm -hmm. like we also get that memory from marsh and one of the other inquisitors was like just had his axe out and was just kind of playing with the bodies afterwards Mm -hmm. so this is like a source of jubilation for them on top of being an actual meaningful ceremony like an actual like productive ceremony it was a birth, you know, and that's the way that he thinks about it is like a <laughs> rebirth a day. Um, mm-hmm. And he gets kind of a sick, twisted joy out of it. And my my brain goes to a question of, is he driving joy from it or is it ruin deriving joy through him? This, this goes back to something I had asked one of the first episodes of this book. If, is it just extreme rioting and soothing of emotions and if that's the case he'd have to at least have that base emotion present in order to tease it out Mm -hmm. in a more like extreme way but there was never any clarification on that or anything else to kind of further that conversation or thought process Mm -hmm. yeah totally so after a brief fight with Marsh using ferric chemical powers, he slams a spike into Penrod's chest and states that he would be under the control of Ruin as surely as any Inquisitor, which I think is a fascinating turn and a great way to end this chapter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. This is that like hemolurgy being of Ruin kind of gets brought back into question and thought into the forefront of my mind. Like, yep. Yep. Ruin is... Has he always had a hand in the Inquisitors in that case, even before the Lord Ruler was gone? I, I think I think there's an argument that he maybe had less of an impact or less control because he was trapped in the well. To say that he didn't have any control, I think, is very different. But I think he was severely limited by being trapped in the well. Because little Ruin is stuck in the well. <laughs> Go find Lassie. <laughs> <laughs> yes excellent (laughs) go find lassie well done all right with that we move into our final chapter of the week chapter 43 we've got our log book here the art we kind of tackles like the art of the three metals and the sort of artifice of hemology in particular so to start off here for all that it disgusts me i cannot help but be impressed by hemology as an art in allomancy and ferrochemy skill and subtlety come through the application of one's powers the best allomancer might not be the most powerful but instead the one who can best manipulate the pushes and pulls of metal the best ferrochemist is the one who is most capable of sorting the information in his copper mind or best able to manipulate his weight with iron the art that is unique to hemology however is the knowledge of where to place the spikes that feels okay so we get the conversation about how given the thousand years the lord ruler never found any additional uh, creatures or creations through hemology other than the first three but the lord ruler is not an adept hemologist this feels like this means that getting ever so more precise could potentially be required to create additional creations out of this process. I don't know where else to go from there, but that's kind of where my my train of thought starts based on that description of what is the adeptitude of a hemologist and what does yeah. it mean? That's that. I mean, that's that's a fair point. And I really I really think of it in kind of two different ways. Allomancy and ferrochemy kind of as the text said, says are skills and it's an application of skill. And it's sort of the this the ability to manipulate the rule set to your advantage. Hemology, however, is really an artifice. 
it is a practice of making things. I, I think art in the term of artifice, like this is this is a building, this is a creation. And I think that that makes it a much more complicated thing. And we've seen, we know that there, from the text, we know that there are between 200 and 300 points of articulation that these spikes could be inputted. And we have found three successful combinations of, of spikes. And that leaves a question of, holy shit, how many different ways could hemolurgy be used to, you know, create something else? And this is sort of, this leaves hemolurgy a little bit more open-ended to be an engine mm-hmm. of, of creation in a big way. And potentially just kind of a wild frontier mm-hmm. of unexplored magic. Right. So, yeah, totally. It makes for a fun, a fun thought experiment of like, it makes hemolurgy more like Legos, whereas, or potentially more like Legos, I should say, whereas Alamancy and Ferrochemy are more concrete. But at the same time, Alamancy and Ferrochemy individually feel like a full-fledged, full-blown magic system. They are. Mm -hmm. They are their own magic systems. And we have enough information to know how full-fledged, like how fleshed out they all are. Presumably, hemolurgy is the same way. We just don't know enough of it yet to be able to like make make a full blown system that could stand on its own without the other two. Yeah. I I think that there's something to be said for the full potential of combinations and, and true breadth of the ability of hemology here that we don't know yet. And, you know, Mm -hmm. might be a little bit more concrete. So, right. Yeah. We go into this chapter here. We're back with Vin being ever so slightly paranoid about this Mistborn that she's been chasing around, like you had mentioned, that she believes to have, you know, marked or marked her. The plan that follows, of course, is one intended to set them up for a successful infiltration with the Mistborn and Yeoman distracted by Ellen's appearance at the ball. Vin would be free to sneak in and check the cash. This, of course, being at the Canton of Resource? Canton of Resource, yeah. Yeah, Resource. Yep. Within this intro section, there's something else that I think is easy to overlook, but I feel like is important. Mm-hmm. Ellen is trying to find that Mistborn that Vin is mm-hmm. talking about and points to something along along the lines of that lump over there when pointing the direction that Vin kind of directs him. And Vin basically just says, eh, close enough. And leaves it at that. But that feels, it it feels very obviously that he doesn't point to exactly what she's seeing. And it makes me think that she's the only one actually seeing this entity and only the the only one actually experiencing this entity in the same way that, that she is. I don't know if that's actually the case, but that's my extrapolated read on that one little bit of conversation between the two of them. Does that make sense? It does. It does. It totally does. No, I don't, I don't think you're rambling at all. I think that it's important because it is, it is a presumption about is Vin seeing things in general, I think is an interesting thing because it's like, why would Vin be seeing things, you know, previously declared as the hero of ages and whatnot. And, you know, we, we have some interesting questions that are of course still raised about who our hero is, or is there another reason that she's seeing things? potentially Mm -hmm. or is ellen just trying to assuage her (laughs) you know in sort of her her paranoia right there's a lot of things to dance around there that's true so they walk themselves into the ball and find themselves announced of course without needing to hand off a card or anything like that because it's obvious they are the the emperor (laughs) and empress it is interesting i i don't think they're announced the emperor and empress necessarily but as it as it goes it's interesting that the canton of resource is kind of so nondescript and also built in like a reverse period like an eiffel tower ish fashion is how my brain imagines it but ultimately fits with kind of what's going on inside, you know, it's the canton of resource. They're not extravagant. They're, they're about allocation and efficiency and effectiveness. And so it makes sense Mm -hmm. that it's kind of stripped down on the inside. Vin has a hard time slipping away from the two alimantic ladies, one being a Tanai and the other being a seeker. I believe it's a seeker, right? No, there was a copper cloud. Copper. Copper cloud. Yep. 
pierce through. Yeah. Yes, you're right. So she has a hard time getting away from them, but also runs into slow swift. And it's kind of a nice thing to see him uh, of whom clearly wanted to have a longer conversation as opposed to this very to the point, get the job done kind of thing. You know, he's, he's the Mm -hmm. poet. He wants to have a little bit more time and a little bit more talk. She, she then to the point of the the reason that she's skipping past slow slow swift sneaks down to the patio and stealthily knocks out the two women following her i i just love this little spy move that happens where they like shove them into the bushes and you know the especially the duralamin emotional vacancy that she forces upon them to like stun them effectively i thought was really Mm -hmm. unique and interesting yeah yeah in general vin is very resourceful here but i don't think i realized how much i missed sneaky vin and sort of (laughs) cat burglar vin that we get here and like it it just there's a whole lot of reminiscing on vin of the past and vin of the first book even on her perspective like from her from herself looking back i think i think reen shows up and talks at some point yeah 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 it's just she has become the best version of herself integrating all parts of who she was in the past, even things that she would have seen as horrible flaws. So I enjoyed it. Yeah. I I think that it is, it is a great moment for that exact reason. Like it is, it highlights a lot of these different things that we've seen growth from Vin since book one. It's a part of the dress conversation that we had last week. It's like, it's all of these culminations of things that we saw set up and see her kind of change and become a very different woman in these moments. She can handle herself. She can pull off a plan, you know, relatively flawlessly. And even with the idea that Reen is still whispering or scratching at the back of her head, she is able to ignore it and be like, I have trust in my husband. You can't make me doubt him. You're you're so far out of my mind and so far gone that you don't deserve, you know, a warrant even of time. A warrant in my notes even <laughs> at this point because she's just moved past it. And I think that's great to the point of sneaky Vin, though. I totally agree with you. I missed sneaky Vin in a big way and sort of even the sort of stealth aspects of these books and sort of the spy nature of the whole thing. Yeah. Oh man. Um, we then move to Ellen after, you know, Vin has the women in her dress stash. She strips down to it like a dark garment that she's wearing. The sort of ensuing conversation that happens between Ellen and Yeoman is kind of an even exchange of information that I really enjoy. Yeoman claims to lack a Mistborn in an attempt to get him to go for a duel. You know, Ellen doesn't believe this, of course, but continues to kind of press. What do you think of Ellen's distraction and proposal for a duel in the city? I mean, first of all, this gives off sort of bleeding place vibes a little bit. I won't get into it more specifically than that, but yeah, (laughs) it does. Yep. I don't think Yeoman is lying at all. Mm -hmm. I think that this entity that Vin is seeing as Yeoman's Bistborn is, as I've mentioned before, internal and is somehow not actually feeding into your gold cognition idea that she's like accidentally burning gold or whatever that is. I think Yeoman is starting to kind of Yeoman is confused. It feels like by how erratic Ellen's conversation is because we had that conversation with Yeoman before where it was very much a equal footing battle of the wits and, and battle of the philosophies. And this feels so much more very obviously trying to distract you with preposterous things that I'm saying and not following through on what could be very long drawn out conversations each time. Like it, it, it feels like he's aware that something fishy is going on, but we don't have enough time here to really see that. It does feel out. like Yeoman's keying into this a little bit more than, mm-hmm. than previously. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a little bit more curious about the entire thing, especially given right. what he's seen happen and what he knows happened to Ellen's men on the outside and what he pulled off the, the sort of trick um, that he pulled off for sure. Right. The, there's one more thing that I wanted to mention here, which is uh, it's more of a Brandon clap clap, but it's the very clever naming of yeoman of which is also an English word 
yeoman that is a person a man holding and cultivating a small landed estate or a freeholder or generally a royal or noble household ranking between a sergeant groomer or squire that basically takes on a, a role to fill a job for a team whenever is necessary they kind of raise money for an organization so he's from the canton of resource which is generally a thing that is in charge of managing the resources not necessarily finance but is kind of that hard working cultivating he's got this small estate that he plans on kind of expanding but for now he's just kind of maintaining in the stead of the lord ruler and then on top of that it's his fucking name like this could not be more <laughs> spot on yeah. of a way to name this character and also very cleverly hidden, like not very cleverly, pretty cleverly hidden. It's an uncommon old English word, but and spelled slightly differently. Yeah. Yeo man is how you would spell it, but it is pronounced yeoman in the same way. Yo, man. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Just wanted to bring that up. I, I yeah. didn't bring it up previously and I locked into it for whatever reason this week. And I was like, oh, God, I got to say that I got to I got to mention it. Um, mm-hmm. So. Cool. All right. Well, we end our week with the last logbook of part three, because next week we start on a <laughs> on the end of a part. So here we are. Each spike, positioned very carefully, can determine how the recipient's body is changed by hemolurgy. A spike in one place creates a monstrous, near mindless beast. In another place, a spike will create a crafty, yet homicidal inquisitor. Without the instinctive knowledge granted by taking the power of the Well of Ascension, Rashik would never have been able to use hemology. With his mind expanded and with a little practice, he was able to intuit where to place spikes that would create the servants he wanted. It is a little known fact that the Inquisitor's torture chambers were actually hemologic laboratories. The Lord Ruler was constantly trying to develop new breeds of servant. It is a testament to hemology's complexity that, despite a thousand years of trying, he never managed to create anything with it beyond the three kinds of creatures he developed during those few brief moments holding the power so i would like to propose a separate reason why it couldn't happen sure intention Mm. okay and i don't know if i want to go further than that i mean okay we can we can box this out a little bit for those of you who haven't read Elantris. We very recently did our episode on Elantris. The short pour should be out right now. You should be able to go listen to it. If you haven't read it, maybe skip the next minute or so. Minute and a half, two. Sure. I, I don't have a whole lot more to say other than Aeon, the, the Aeon door. One, one of the rules is intention. Like You can't create, you can't conduct this magic form without intending to so if that can be applied to hemology even if he's trying to just stumble into another creation if he's not actually intending to create that specific thing maybe that's not possible that's interesting i don't know if it's right or wrong but i do think that it is an interesting spin on why it didn't work. I wonder if there are just so many combinations that it would be, you know, mathematically nigh impossible, impossible considering all of the, like, consider the fact that for each of these hemological compositions, you would need to try just a straight up blessing. You would need to try actual spikes. You might need to try fresh spikes. You might need to try decayed spikes. Like the, the preponderance of like, numbers of different spikes and information and possibilities is so out there that it would be hard to come up with something that kind of falls between the lines. That's Um, fair. But I I don't think that you're holistically wrong. I I think that there's got to be something there as well. I think intent is important to the system as well in its own right. Okay. Does that make sense? Like I don't, it does. It feels like it's both, but I, I lean more on the one side than the other. Totally. Yeah. Totally fair. Cool. All right. Well, that's the end of the episode for the week. If you are, we're, we're done talking about Elantris, although you should go check out our short pour, talking about Elantris. It should be out by now. Words and Whiskey Short Pours. Search it on your podcatcher of choice. Give it a listen. It should be fun. We do talk mm-hmm. a little bit about our opinions about how the two books kind of wrap together and whatnot as well. So give that a go. Beyond that, PJ, we would usually run into PJ's predictions here, but the fact is, 
is we haven't had any come close to being brought up or to coming true in in these weeks. But I can promise you that we now have hit, we've passed the halfway point in the novel. We've half passed the halfway point in covering this book today. So they're going to start coming true. <laughs> We're going to start yep. paying them off. Yep. Cool. Right. All right. With that, next week, we are reading chapters 44 through 50. Chapters 44 through 50. And keep in mind, if you want to know what chapters or anything like that we have going on, you can always check out our website, wordsandwhiskey.show forward slash schedule. Yeah, that's where we'll leave you for the week. Thank you, as ever, to Tim and Andrew for helping us keep our show's lights on. You can find all the links in our show notes where you'll see our schedule, Patreon, previous episodes, websites, social media accounts, all in one very easy convenient location yeah beyond that as pj had mentioned check us out words whiskey pod on twitter instagram wet it wet it wet it wet check, it. Check, check out words whiskey pod on words twitter whiskey, instagram and reddit you can send us an email at words and whiskey show at gmail.com or join our patreon at patreon.com forward slash words and whiskey check out our t-shirts on t public follow the link within the show notes to check those out leave us a review on your podcatcher of choice and leave every podcast you like a review damn it i'm always an advocate because it's like it is massive so just do it appreciate all the people i plan on doing a read review spree we've got a couple of new ones in here so i think it'd be probably a good thing to tie that back Beyond all of that, talking about all the other shows, I already mentioned we have a short pour that came out this week talking about Elantris, of which is fantastic. We have a really, really, really exciting short pour that we're going to be talking about next month. That is going, that is, we'll tell you what it is at the end of the other short pour. Otherwise, you can check it out on social media whenever we decide to share that in a week or two. Beyond that, we also have new episodes coming out of our new show in collaboration with Catacomb Party, rather called Catacomb Party, The Tales of Kana. At this point, we've got the first three episodes out there, and it is, I'm i I'm really pleased with the whole thing. Yeah, um, me too. And, and, uh, and everyone's reaction early on here is, is fantastic, and I really love it. I'm very, 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 very excited. So uh, give that a check in case you are interested. It's a little bit of a, it's an, a D&D actual play podcast. We make a lot of jokes about D&D, and then we started a D&D podcast with some of our friends. So highly recommend you check it out. Me too. We that was really wordy, but here I am being wordy. It's my gig. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole thing. All right. See you guys next week.